Well, the title of the message this morning is God's Deliverance, and through these chapters, my hope is that the saving hand of God will be put on display for us, that this story will act like a blinking light in our minds over the next couple of months, over the next six months, over the next year, that when you think about who God is, that this story will remind you of the truth that God is a great Savior who delights in saving. Isaiah 59.1 says, Indeed, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save, and his ear is not too deaf to hear, that there is no problem God cannot solve. He has unlimited wisdom and unlimited resources that he will use for delivering his people. And his deliverance for David is what we're going to see here this morning in the passage. And he's going to deliver David through three different people. So if you're taking notes, here's the outline. It's Jonathan, Michael, and Samuel, that God is going to do his saving and delivering work through these three human beings. So let's start with Jonathan. 1 Samuel 19, 1 says, Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. Now this is the order that changes everything. Everything is now going to be different because Saul's murderous intent is now out in the open. No more hiding for Saul. In chapter 18, we saw that murder was in the heart of Saul, but he was cloaking it with religious devotion. He tried to pretend that he really loved David, that he was for David, but he was really trying to kill him. But at this point, he gives an order that changes everything. And it changes everything because it means that Jonathan and all of Saul's servants must pick a side. The question is, will Jonathan and Saul's servants side with Saul an attempt to kill David, or will they side with David and go against the orders of Saul? And for Jonathan, there was a clear choice. Verse 1 goes on to say, but Saul's son Jonathan liked David very much. He told him, my father Saul intends to kill you. Be on your guard in the morning and hide in a secret place and stay there. I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are and talk to him about you. When I see what he says, I'll tell you. Jonathan spoke well of David to his father. He said to him, the king should not sin against his servant David. He hasn't sinned against you. In fact, his actions have been a great advantage to you. He took his life in his hands when he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. So why would you sin against innocent blood by killing David for no reason? And so Jonathan goes out and he reasons with his dad. He says, Dad, this is a terrible plan. Your plan to kill David is a terrible plan. It is a huge mistake. David is the best thing that's ever happened to you. God has produced so much good in the nation of Israel through this young man. There is more safety. There is more security. There is more blessing. There is more victory because of what God has done through this young man. So why would you put him to death? He has done nothing to you. And what Jonathan is doing here is truly remarkable. When you read the story, it's easy to think what's going on is that Jonathan is just having a conversation with his dad. But actually, there is something much bigger happening, that Jonathan is risking his life at this point. To go against the king was to risk your life. And so Jonathan is doing something remarkable. But why is this remarkable? Well, I just want to give you two reasons it's remarkable. First, Jonathan doesn't know David very well. Jonathan and David, they don't have like a 20-year history of friendship, but their friendship is a relatively new friendship. We see that Jonathan and David meet for the first time in chapter 17, in verse 57. It says, when David returned from killing the Philistines, so do you remember this event? This is a big event. And we need to imagine the intensity of the scene. You got to go back in time to this event where for 40 days and for 40 nights, The nation of Israel was terrified. They were scared out of their minds because the Philistines had a a giant, Goliath, and they were outmatched on the battlefield. And it says that terror was filling the hearts of the Israelite army, that Saul was terrified, all their commanders were terrified, the soldiers were terrified, and they didn't know what to do, so they did nothing. They just waited. Day after day after day, the Philistines taunted Israel. And then one day, a shepherd boy, a little teenager, He says, I'll fight him. I'll go out and fight the the giant. And so you see this little teenage boy go out to fight this seasoned warrior. David would have looked like a light snack for Goliath, that Goliath is going to rip him apart and feed his body to the birds of the air. But David actually kills Goliath. He actually takes him down and kills him. 
So it says, when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hands. So do you have this image? Here's David holding the Philistine's head in his hands. I don't think this part is in the Veggie Tale version of the story. I mean, this is a brutal scene. I mean, imagine how big his head would have been just standing there. So he's standing there likely in the tent talking with Saul, and Jonathan is likely with him. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? The son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem, David, David answered. Verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1. When David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship and loved him as much as he loved himself. So this is when they meet. This is when the friendship begins. In chapter 18, verse 1, that Jonathan sees David and he says, that's my guy. That's the guy I want to be friends with. He has an extraordinary spirit. He, he, he is a young man who is filled with courage. God is with him, and I want to be friends with that guy. So they're bound together in friendship. This happens in chapter 18, verse 1, and we're only in chapter 19, and not much time has transpired in the story. And so for Jonathan to go against his dad is to risk his life for a young man that he barely knows. He barely knows David. It's, it's a remarkable thing to actually risk your life and to do it for someone you barely know. The second reason it's remarkable is that Jonathan helping David ensured he wouldn't be king. So as Jonathan is helping David, he's actually working against his own personal interest. Jonathan was set to be the king of Israel. The, the, there, was no, there was no challenger. He was the undisputed king to be. And this is hard for us even to imagine. I mean, it's a difficult thing to even understand the type of situation Jonathan is in. I mean, how many of you have been in a situation like this where you're waiting to become king, the supreme leader of an entire country? Any, any one of you? No, none of us. We can't even imagine that type of honor and power and privilege and pleasure that Jonathan had access to. And he gives it all up. He voluntarily gives it all up. He lays it down for a teenage boy that he barely knows. And he doesn't just remain neutral. He doesn't say this. He doesn't say, you know what, David and, and Dad, this thing is between you guys. I'm going to stay out of it. You guys figure it out, and whatever happens, happens. That's not what he does. He risks his life to make sure he doesn't become king, but that David becomes king. And God honors his efforts. God honors his efforts. It's, it's an amazing thing. If you look at verse 6, it says, Saul listened to Jonathan's advice and swore an oath. And an oath is a big deal. For Saul to make an oath is a big deal. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. So Jonathan summoned David and told him all these words. Then Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he served him as he did before. So David goes back into the palace, and he's now Saul's musician. Things go back to, quote, normal, but, it, but this does not last very long. If you look at verses 9 and 10, you see that eventually Saul picks up the spear and throws the spear at David once again, attempting to kill him. And so as I've been working through this, this text, the, the big question in my mind is this. It's why does Saul go against his oath? To make an oath was a big deal. And in verse 7, he makes an oath. Surely David will not die. David is not going to die, but then in verse 9, he throws a spear at David. So what is happening here? Why does Saul go against his oath and attempt to kill David? Well, it's kind of funny. This week, I was actually researching this question, and I came across a Babylon Bee article, which if you don't know what Babylon Bee is, it's a satirical website, but this is the headline. This is all you need to see. It says, scholars now believe Saul threw spear at David for playing Christmas music well before Thanksgiving, which I thought was pretty good. It's pretty good here, but this is not why Saul throws a spear at David, but this is what I came across as I was researching it. So why does he throw a spear at David? Why does he go against his oath so quickly? Well, the writer of 1 Samuel wants us to know. There, there are two reasons, at least. First, there are two clues. The first one is the spear. In verse 9, it says, Now an evil spirit sent from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his palace holding a spear. So here's Saul in the palace. He's holding a spear. And whenever I read the Bible, my intent is to simply understand what the Bible is saying. What does it mean? I, I, I do not want to import some significance into a text that's not there. 
That's the wrong way to read the Bible. And so I'm very hesitant to, to try to symbolize everything unless it's founded in the text. And when you look at this passage and you see Saul is standing in the palace holding a spear, the writer of 1 Samuel wants us to understand what the spear symbolizes. That, that the spear is a symbol of godless self-reliance. That it is the picture. If you want to know what's happening in Saul's life, Saul is not worshiping God. And the way the writer reveals this to us is through the spear. And let me show you this. 1 Samuel 17, 45 says, David said to the Philistine, this is when David goes after Goliath. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin. So do you have this image in your mind? He's going out to fight Goliath. And he says to Goliath, You come at me with a sword, spear, and javelin. But what's David's weapon? Well, you say, it's the sling, duh. But that's not what he says. He says, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies. So here's the contrast. What weapon is David using? It is, he comes against Goliath, not with a weapon, in his hands. But he comes against Goliath in the name of the Lord of armies. The God of the ranks of Israel You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know something. What do do they need to know? What does David understand is going to happen? He says, then, and, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. And so what what David understands is that the the key issue in the battle is not the weapons that are in, in his hands or in Saul's hands. That's not the key issue. The key issue is what will the Lord do? What will God do in this situation? And I think this is likely a major part of why David is called a man after God's own heart. Because in the time of testing, when he's staring down death, what he trusts in is not in the weapons that he has in his hands, but he's trusting in who God is. And so what you see with Saul is that Saul, from this point, he then picks up a spear in his hand and repeatedly, at least three times, we're told that Saul is holding a spear in his hand and he throws that spear at David twice and then he picks up that spear and throws it at Jonathan. It is the picture of godless self-reliance and it is eventually the thing that will kill Saul. It is the very spear that he's holding. It is the key to his downfall. It is the key to his death and Saul could not defeat Goliath with the spear in his hand And when we see him in the palace, he cannot defeat his jealousy and envy with the spear in his hands. He is vulnerable. It is a picture of incredible vulnerability because he's trusting himself instead of God. The second clue is jealousy and envy. Verse 8 says, when war broke out again, David went out and fought against the Philistines. He defeated them with such great force that they fled from him. And so in this story, all of a sudden... We get this little insight into what's happening in the battle, that there's another war that breaks out, and David wins again. And as David succeeds, remember from last week, two things happen. First, Israel loves David more and more, that as David succeeds, all the people, chapter 18 makes this clear, all the people love David. Saul's servants love David. The nation loves David. It says that Jonathan loved David, that Michael loves David. Everybody loves David. David. So his fame is spreading. Remember the song that they were singing about David? 1 Samuel 18, 7 says, as they danced, the women sang, closed on Sundays, you my Chick-fil-A. Now, if you don't know what song this is, this is actually a Kanye West song, but the reason I bring this up is because what, when we look at verse 7, what, what we should understand is that this is not some isolated little thing. Like this song is not just like five ladies singing it, but we're told about this to understand the nature of David's fame. That that this is the song that is sweeping the celebration. This is the song that is dominating the culture. 
that this is the song that is in Saul's head. And so as, as this song is spreading, that's what songs often do. I mean, my kids have been singing that song all week long. You my number one with that lemonade. I mean, they just keep singing this song over and over and over again. And, it, and the culture is singing the song and listening to the song because that's the nature of songs is that they spread. And this song almost certainly has spread throughout Israel talking about the heroics of David. David is the man. And so as David succeeds, his, his fame increases radically. And the second thing that happens is that Saul's jealously grows more and more. So here's the contrast. David succeeds, everyone loves him. And as everyone loves him, Saul cannot handle it. His jealousy gets out of control. So he takes the spear that's in his hand, the picture of godless self-reliance, and he throws it at David, attempting to kill him. So that's why. He, he knows in verse seven, Saul knows in verse seven it is completely irrational to kill David. But because of his jealousy, because of his envy, it overrides what he knows to be true. He he goes against what he knows to be true. He is vulnerable to his sin. He has no defense because he's trusting himself. So now David is on the run and he needs more help. And the second way God is gonna deliver David is through his wife, Michael, verse 11. Saul sent agents to David's house to watch him or watch for him and kill him in the morning. But his wife, Michael, warned David, if you don't escape tonight, you will be dead tomorrow. So she lowered David from the window, and as he fled and, exca- and he fled and escaped. Then Michael took the household idol. Now, if you're reading the story, you say, wait a second, they have a household idol? What's this all about? Well, likely, this, this indicates the character of Michael. It's hard for me to imagine that David, a man after God's own heart, has an idol that he's bowing down to in his house. Maybe that's what's happening, but it seems unlikely that this is likely the idol of Michael. This is what she's worshiping. Saul was an idol worshiper. He did not worship God. And so it would make sense that his daughter, likewise, would be worshiping an idol. And this just happens to be a very large idol, like the size of a mannequin. And so I love this. She takes the household idol, puts it in bed, and then it says, puts it uh, on the bed, and then place some goat hair on its head. So then she gets some goat hair, puts it on his head, puts a blanket over him. Verse 14, when Saul sent agents to seize David, Michael said, he's sick. Verse 15, Saul sent the agents back to see David and said, bring him on his bed so I can kill him. So they said, that's no problem. David doesn't even need to get out of bed. We'll just take the bed. Let's just go. We're going to kill him. When the agents arrived, to their surprise, the household idol was on the bed with some goat hair on its head. Saul asked Michael, why did you deceive me like this? You sent my, my enemy away and he has escaped. She answered him, He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? And so what Michael is doing is saying, Dad, you know that David's a bad guy. That's why you're trying to kill him, right? That's why you're trying to kill him. He's a bad guy, and this is what he did. He threatened me. And so I was simply defending myself, trying to survive. So she's lying to her dad. Now, this is not necessarily a textbook example of how to handle a situation, but nevertheless, God uses it. God uses what Michael does to deliver David But now David is homeless. He's not safe in the palace. He's not safe in his own home. He has to flee. And for roughly a decade, there's a little bit of dispute, but for years and years, roughly a decade, David is not welcome in the palace. He's on the run. He will not be able to return home. And this marks a substantial transition point in the book of 1 Samuel. David is no longer welcome in the palace, not welcome in his own house. And so now he's going to be living in caves, in the wilderness. He's going to be on the run. He's not going to know who to trust. He's not going to know when this will end or how this will end. He is now a fugitive because Saul is hell-bent on killing David. So if you're David, you're not welcome in the palace, you're not welcome in your house, you're not welcome anywhere, where do you go? Where do you run to? Well, Samuel. He runs to Samuel. And when he runs to Samuel, God is going to deliver David once again, but in a, in a way that you would not expect. And in many ways, he doesn't really even do anything. God doesn't really do anything through Samuel. He, he does something 
that is not in our typical categories. It's, it's, it's as if you expect that God is going to do something very direct through Samuel. He does something through Jonathan. He uses Jonathan. Then he uses Michael, and he runs to Samuel. He's going to use Samuel. But he does something very strange. This is what it says in verse 18. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him everything Saul had done to him. Then he said to Samuel, or then he and Samuel left and stayed at Nioth. When it was reported to Saul that David was at Nioth and Ramah, he sent agents to seize David. However, when they saw the group of prophets prophesying with Samuel leading them, the Spirit of God came on Saul's agents and they also started prophesying. What? That is we- Isn't that weird? That all, the agents are coming to kill David, and then when they show up, they see the, the prophets, and the Spirit of God overwhelms them, and they join in the prophesying. Verse 21, when they reported to Saul, that would have been a very weird report. <laughs> We've been swept away by the Spirit. He sent other agents. He says, okay, round two, go get them. And they also began prophesying. So they show up and they begin prophesying. So Saul tried again and sent a third group of agents. And and even they began prophesying. So they just keep running after David and they, they come into this group of people and the spirit overwhelms them and they begin prophesying. Verse 22. Then Saul himself went to Ramah. It's as if he's saying, if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. And so here comes the big dog. Here comes the king. I'm going to get this thing done. It says, He came to the large cistern at Seku and asked, Where are Samuel and David? At Nioth and Ramah, someone said. And he went to Nioth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God also came on him. And as he walked along, he prophesied until he entered Nioth and Ramah. Saul then removed his clothes and also prophesied before Samuel. He collapsed and lay naked all that day and all that night. That is why they say, is Saul also among the prophets? And so it's like, what is, hap- what is happening here? Why is God doing this? This is a very direct work of God's Holy Spirit. He- he's overwhelming the agents, the, the, the troops of Saul, and then, then he goes after Saul, and he's now filled with God's Spirit, and he's prophesying. He's joining in with the prophets. And so what's happening here? Well, something very important is happening here, and it is too exact to be an accident. There's something happening here that the writer of 1 Samuel wants us to understand, and what is happening is the official undoing of Saul's kingship, that God is officially stripping Saul of his kingship. It's like he's reversing what happened initially. Let me show you this. You see in chapter 9 how Saul became king, and there's these five steps. Number one, Saul, become, or Saul comes to Ramah. Step two, Saul comes to a well and asks for directions to find Samuel. Step three, Saul prophesies with a group of prophets. Step four, people marvel. Is Saul also among the prophets? Step five, the Spirit comes on Saul and invests him with authority. So he receives the Holy Spirit, he's anointed king, eventually he gets his robe, he's recognized before the people. It's a big deal. He's now the king. This is the working of God. This is the plan of God. And then several years later, Saul shows up in Ramah. It's like, it, it is as if God is drawing him there. He, 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 Saul sends agents, soldiers to go get David, but they all are overwhelmed by God's spirit it is as if God is drawing Saul to Rama. That's where he's at. Come on, come on. That's the first step. Saul comes back to Rama. Step two, Saul comes to a well and asks for directions to find Samuel. Step three, Saul prophesies with a group of prophets. Step four, people joke. Is Saul also among the prophets? Step five, the spirit comes on Saul and divests him of his clothes. It's like this stripping away, this official undoing that God does in Saul's life. He is being stripped totally. He's actually laying naked on the ground, humiliated. This is the king who's been stripped of everything. And if you wanna know where self-reliance, jealousy, and envy eventually takes you, it takes you to a place that you don't expect. It, it, It takes you to utter ruin. It takes you to utter 
humiliation. You do things on your own terms, this is where it will take you. It will, it will be your undoing. It says, he collapsed and lay naked all that day and all that night. And see, Saul's approach with the spear, this godless self-reliance motivated by jealousy and envy, it actually produces the very thing Saul wanted, wanted to avoid. Uh, Saul wanted to avoid disgrace. Remember, he's so preoccupied with what the people think about him. He wants to avoid chaos in his kingdom, chaos in his family. He doesn't want to be put to shame. But because he took matters in his, into his own hands and he trusts himself, it actually leads to the very thing that Saul wants to avoid. And it is wreaking havoc in his family. You see now that his son and his daughter are against him. You see that the Holy Spirit is now working against Saul. His kingdom is uncertain, insecure. And he's ruining David's life. He's hurting David so badly, the man of God. And for the first time, we begin to see the emotional burden that this, this situation is producing in David's life. So far, we've seen David's success. Everything is going great. But now you begin to see that this situation is getting to David. Chapter 20, verse 1, it says that David runs to Jonathan. And this is what he says. What have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? And the answer is nothing. David has done nothing wrong, and yet he's suffering miserably. So he's having this experience. He said, I've been trying to trust God. I've been obeying God. I've been, I've been taking risks to glorify God. I've risked my life. I, I'm trying to be above reproach, and yet I have been removed from the palace. I'm not safe in my own house. I'm on the run. I'm losing everything. It would be hard to blame David if David would have risen up and crushed Saul. I mean, throw a spear at me once, shame on you. Throw a spear at me twice, off with your head. It's done, it's over. Saul's true intent can no longer be hidden. But David will not, he will not raise his hand against God's anointed, even though God's anointed King Saul is a wicked man. He will not go against him. And because of that, he loses everything. He loses his home. He loses his reputation. He's on the run. He walks into such a difficult situation. And it's not short term. It lasts for a long time. And this is likely at least a decade where he's not sure who, who he can trust. And his life is constantly in danger. And so the question is this, is how do you, how do you deal with this if you're David? Like, what do you do? Because there, there are going to be times and there are going to be situations where you're like, God, I'm tr trying to trust you. I'm trying to obey you. I'm, do I'm putting you first. I'm taking risks for your name's sake. And you find yourself in a situation that you hate, that is painful, that is confusing. So how, how do you endure difficulty like this? Because it's going to come. How do you do it? Well, here are three points of application for you. Number one is get some good friends. Get some good friends. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any good friends? Like, do you actually, like people that you really know and love and people who really know you and love you, do you have real friends? Good friends are so valuable. I'm not talking about people that you kind of know. I'm talking about people that you're just totally connected with. And you might, you might think, you know, my spouse, my spouse, I'm, she's my best friend, he's my best friend. And that's good. That's good. And there's this unique role that your spouse will play in your life and your spiritual development. And it is irreplaceable. It is such a wonderful, beautiful, awesome thing. But if you're a wise man, a wise husband, you will recognize the necessity to have other good friends than your spouse. You, you say, I need other men in my life who know me and love me that I'm accountable to people who can speak into my life, and the same thing's true for you ladies, that you need, you need women in your life, women who can speak into your life, people who can call you out, people who can encourage you, people who can come alongside of you. Good friends are hard to find. Good friends typically don't happen accidentally, at least not for a long, a long term. I mean, when you think about long-term relationships, good friendships typically don't last practically for that long. 
But see, God is going to sustain and encourage David through Jonathan. And what's really interesting is where, in the story, where does David go? We could pull a Jesus juke and say this. David, you need to run to God. How dare you run to another human being? I mean, we could just kind of over-spiritualize it, but where does David go? He goes to his friend. And I think that this really is a picture of how God designs friendships to work. David goes and he pours out his heart to his friend. He says, what have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? Jonathan said to him, no, you won't die. Listen, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without telling me. So why would he hide this matter from me? This can't be true. But David said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor with you. He has said, Jonathan must not know of this or else he will be grieved. David also swore, as surely as the Lord lives. So think about this scenario. Here's David. He says, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. He says, David says, Jonathan, I am so close to dying here. And look at Jonathan's response. It is, it is wonderful. Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. Whatever you say. He goes, I'm, David, I am here for you. I have got your back. Whatever you need, I, I got it. You can count on me. And remember, Jonathan has a lot at stake here. David dies, he's king. And Jonathan, Jonathan, he humbles himself. He comes alongside David, says, whatever, whatever you need, I got you. I got you. And so this becomes an incredible example for us. And I think to myself, that's the type of friend that I want to be in people's lives. I want to be the type of person who is fiercely loyal. People who someone who will rally around other people, someone who has other people's back, people I'm not competing with, people I'm not, I'm not fighting for position or power, but people who I trust, they trust me, and we labor together. And you are actually commanded to do this. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee from youthful passions. Do you see the command? Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, Pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You, you are to pursue people who call on the Lord with a pure heart. You are to see people who are walking with God and say, I want to be friends with you. I want to walk with you. And I think this is what Jonathan did. I, I think Jonathan said, you know, David, when I saw you holding Goliath's head, I knew we were going to be great friends. <laughs> You're my type of guy. <laughs> You're my type. That's, that's the type of person I want to be united with. And many of you here this morning, you are in community and you are pursuing those types of friendships. And you've tasted with your own mouth the joy and the blessing of close friendships. You know what it's like. You've experienced this. Psalm one. 33 says, how good and pleasant it is when people, God's people, live together in unity. It is so good. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, when they love each other, where there's harmony, where there's trust and friendship. People aren't, aren't living for themselves. People aren't competing with one another, but there's real oneness, real unity. Now, how good is it? It goes on to say, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. And we all know how good that is, so I don't even need to explain what that means. It's just so good. It's, it's like oil all over your beard. <laughs> Whatever that means. But it's good. It is really good. And many of you have tasted that, and you know what that's like. Galatians 6 2 says this there's a command carry one another's burdens. You are to carry one another's burdens. You're to be in a relationship so that when weight gets placed on people's shoulders, you run alongside of them and you help carry it. And see, David has a lot of weight that has been put on his shoulders. I mean, think about that burden, the burden of trying to just survive. And Jonathan comes alongside, 
And he says, let me help you carry that. It says, carry one another's burdens. Now, what happens when you carry one another's burdens? In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know why you don't want to carry other people's burdens? Or at least one reason? Because they're burdens. <laughs> they're burdens. It, it changes your life. If, you might think, well, I, I have all this stuff going on in my life. I have no space, no room to carry extra weight. And so we remain distant and separated from people. But I think that's not the way God has designed us to live. He, he wants us to carry one another's burdens. And many of you, you live that way. Many of you, that's how you're living. That's, that's, you've set up your lives to be in community, to be devoted to one another. But many of you aren't living that way. You don't live that way. And you're violating God's design for the Christian life. You think you can do it on your own terms and your own way. I read an article this week I thought was really interesting. It's in NBC News. This is what it says. It's, it just says, let's look at the numbers. The average person in the U.S. has only one close friend. According to a study published by the American Sociological Review, one in four people have no confidants at all, zero. To make things worse, 75% of people say they're unsatisfied with the friendships that they have. They go on to say this level of disconnection is dangerous to our health. Loneliness has been alleged to have the same impact on our life expectancy as, as smoking 15 cig cigarettes a day with a risk factor that rivals excessive drinking or obesity. In addition, a lack of social contact can hasten cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, heart disease, depression, and suicide. Yet of all age groups, Generation Z, anyone ranging from 18 to 22, seems to be particularly impacted. According to a recent study conducted by Cigna, Gen Z is significantly more likely than any other age group to say that they're exper or they experience feelings that are associated with loneliness, and they go on from there. And if you look at the, the world we live in right now, people are lonely. They are lonely. They have no real friends, or very few real friends. And so what I want to encourage you to do is just obey the word of God. Obey God's word and make the people of God a priority in your life. To say, I, I'm going to obey God. See, community is something that you join. Community does not come to you. You have to join community. And so much of the fight of the Christian life is just learning to take the priorities of the scripture and make them the priorities of your life. And our hearts are loaded with excuses. Probably the most common one here, if I were to guess, is the excuse, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy for community. But see, that excuse has an underlying assumption that is false. That excuse assumes that those who obey the command to be in community have nothing better to do. They're in community because they're not busy. Because the argument goes, I'm too busy for community. If I was less busy, then I would be in community. But that's not true. If you were less busy, you would fill it with something else. The issue is will we fight to take God's word and the priorities of the scripture and make them the priorities of our life? Now certainly there are seasons and sickness and all kinds of things happen. So I'm not talking about a week to week type of deal where sometimes crazy things happen. You have 12 sicknesses in your house with your kids. At one time, that's probably going to happen. I, I, I understand that. I'm talking about the pattern of your life. How do you build your life? What is the pattern? And if you want to learn how to keep fighting the good fight of faith, God wants to do much good in your life by you pursuing close friendships within the body. And if you want to know how a church grows and is strengthened, you want to know what makes a strong church? It's when a church is filled with Jonathans. Someone who's not fighting for their position, but someone who is humble and says, I'm not competing with you. I want to bear your burdens. But oftentimes, unfortunately, churches are filled with Saul's. People who are, who are competing. People doing things in their own way on their own terms. And so I just want to encourage you, obey the command. Obey. Figure it out. Talk to your spouse. How do we put these things in how do we put these priorities in our 
lives. I believe that is part of the way God wants to sustain us. Number two is understand our friendship with God. Understand our friendship with God. Good friends are really good and helpful, but they are no substitute for walking with God. That, that if you have 12 great friends, that does not replace the essential nature of learning to walk with God himself. We, in one very real sense, we've been created for community. We've been created to be connected in relationships, which requires humility and sacrifice. But in a much deeper sense, ultimately, we have been created for God. We have been created to know God and walk with God. And what is so interesting to me about the story of Saul and David is that this story ultimately points to Christ, that David is the rightful king, and Saul knows it, but Saul says, I will not have this man rule over me. This man, he will not rule over me. And so Saul, from a position of power, motivated by envy, orders the death of King David. Then to bring about this death, Saul throws a spear at David, yet David is able to move and get out of the way and flee. Then a thousand years later, the rightful king, the king of kings, Jesus Christ, shows up. And those in a position of power following the pattern of Saul hate him. And they say, we will not have this man to rule over us. Then from a position of power, motivated by, motivated by envy, order the death of King Jesus. Matthew 27 says, for he, being Pilate, knew it was because of envy that they handed him over. Then a spear was thrown at Jesus, yet he did not move or run because he was nailed to a cross. John 19, 34 says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once water and blood and water came out. And so the spear that missed David, it lands on Jesus at the cross, which is the very design of God, that the king of kings, the ultimate king, the king that King David points to, might die in our place. Now, why does he die on the cross? We know the story, Jesus hanging on the cross. Why does he die on the cross? Jesus dies on the cross that we might become his friends. That's why he dies. And what Jesus is doing at the cross is that he is, he is taking the position of an enemy of God, that at the cross, Jesus positionally becomes an enemy of God. This is what it means when it says that Christ died even for his enemies. And you might think, wait, wait a minute, who are the enemies of God? You are the enemy of God. What makes a person an enemy of God? It's when we love sin rather than God, when we love evil more than righteousness, when we love darkness more than the light, when we say, I will do things in my, my way. Do you want, to know, you want to know the telltale sign of what it looks like to be an enemy of God? Let me, you know what it is? You have the same attitude as Saul, and you have the same attitude as the Pharisees. And you know what the attitude is? We will not have this man rule over us. And many of you, that's your attitude. You say, Jesus will not be my Lord. He will not call the shots. I have too much to lose. I do things my own way. That is the sign that you're still an enemy of God. But the good news is that Jesus died for his enemies. He died for his enemies. And the rightful, just wrath of God fell on Christ so that in him we might become God's friends. And that is who we are. You're a Christian. You're a friend of God. You're not just some random person in the kingdom of God that no one knows. But rather, God knows you. He loves you. And you can walk with him. And this transaction happens not by going to church. You don't, become, you don't move from being an enemy to being a friend by going to church or being a good person or believing in God or reading the Bible or stopping, stopping your sinful behavior. You become a friend of God when you repent of your sin. You, you recognize my sin has separated me from my God. So you repent of your sin and you look to the cross and you say, there's my king. And what I want in my life is I want this man to rule over me. I find no greater joy than to have this man, Jesus Christ, who lived for me, who died for me and rose again, to reign over me. I want him to be king. I want him to call the shots. And when you repent and you look to the cross, you embrace Christ, it says your sins are forgiven. 
and you have a new life. You have a salvation that has been purchased by Christ, a a salvation that is accomplished by grace. And so enjoy your friendship with God. He died to make you his friend. So walk with him. And so he wants us to be sustained through one another, certainly, but also by walking with him, by walking with him, by knowing him. Are you walking with him? You will find much grace and power as you do. Number three is understand why you're suffering. Understand why you're suffering. Understand the purposes of God for your pain. That that God is not haphazardly allowing or causing David to walk through this pain. So here's the question. What What are God's purposes in David's pain? David is beginning to say, I don't get it, God. What's going on here? So what are God's purposes in David's pain and his suffering? Well, would you like to know the answer? You're going to have to come back next week. Because next week is going to be about seeing the purposes of God in David's pain. That's what we're going to see. And I just need to warn you, setting some expectations, we're just going to get a spoonful of it next week, and then the next week another spoonful of it. It's not going to come at, it, at us all at once, but what we're going to see is the wisdom of God in walking David through this pain. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you really are, you really are good. You are the king who died in our place to make us your friends, and that, that is who we are. We are your friends, and we can walk with you today because of what you've done for us. Uh, I pray, Lord, for those here this morning who are not in community, God, I pray you'd give them wisdom that they might make the priorities of the scriptures the priorities of their life. And I pray most of all, Lord, that we would, we would trust you. God, that, that is your love language. When we trust you, Help us to walk with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.